Just 40 miles west of the Twin Cities, along the South Fork of the Crow River, sits the charming little community of Watertown. Here along the main drag, Dr. Scott Jensen built a medical clinic some 15 years ago. You can't contain Scott. He's a little bit uh, a powder keg in terms of just uh, his presence. He's just everywhere. A family physician for more than 32 years, it's his patients that keep this powder keg fully charged. Dr. Jensen has many stories to tell, which is why he finally decided to write a book. I'm a meticulous note taker. In it, he reflects on the time-honored connection between patient and physician, conveying that medical care should be personal and that relationships matter. And as I watched medicine changing and I saw the patient-doctor relationship becoming more and more fractured, less and less significant, I said, that's where those stories have to go. They have to focus on somehow reminding us of the patient-doctor relationship that it is special. To truly understand how Dr. Jensen practices, you have to hear from his patients. Hey, well, it's really awesome to have somebody who knows you so well, kind of inside and out. I said, uh, I'm getting old. He said, no, you are not getting old. You are old. <laughs> it's very realistic also. <laughs> That'd be great. Thanks, appreciate it. I would say that in 30 years of ministry, I have been interrogated two times, once by Scott Jensen. Joel Johnson, a patient and Dr. Jensen's pastor, will always remember the day they met. I figured if he's this thorough and making a decision about the church, I can only imagine the kind of doctor he would be. Scott Jensen grew up in the southern Minnesota town of Sleepy Eye, a middle child of five siblings. Tragically, he lost his mom to colon cancer. She was in her 40s. She sort of looked like Doris Day. She was my best friend. So that was a tough one. A decade later, his dad died, and then his youngest brother. But I do think that going through so much death in such a short period of time, it really set me up to be what I would like to think a compassionate family doc. His career path wasn't a straight one. It included a year of dental school. I really enjoyed the gross anatomy, the biochemistry, the physiology, but I just didn't have a love affair with teeth. He then spent a year in the seminary, where he decided to propose to his girlfriend and go to medical school, finishing in just three years. He did his residency at Bethesda Hospital in St. Paul. So I've had a wonderful career in medicine, and uh, my wife is the best thing that's happened to me. She's the love of my life. He met his wife, Mary, who's a veterinarian in college. And his first words to me are, oh, are you uh, oxidizing an aldehyde into a ketone? Not only is Minnesota Senator Scott Jensen a family practitioner, practitioner with a clinic in Watertown, he is also a lawmaker. He was one of the first to raise concerns about this change. I caught up with him for an interview this afternoon, and he's spoken to a lot of folks, but isn't getting the answers he's looking for. When we found out last week that the changes in reporting COVID-19 cases in hospitals and ICUs uh, were being done by the Minnesota Department of Health, you put out your Facebook video. We were able to show some of that. Your first reaction when you heard this was what? If we are trying to be transparent, if we are trying to include Minnesotans in the conversation, why does the Department of Health do this? Uh, we were going to have a special guest in here in just a second, Dr. Scott Jensen. I saw his uh, his thread yesterday, his video, and I thought, oh my God, I must interview him. There's a lot to go here and get into here. Uh, and I also was thinking about uh, Alex Ashkazvili's comment yesterday when he went, what the hell, in terms of what's going on at the University of Washington, the covid19.healthdata.org uh, site, where the graphs are sort of seemingly lost. And I, and I thought, I, I was thinking a lot about that this morning, and I think the data, I think things are changing so fast their graphs don't reflect reality right now. So get your information from COVID Tracking Project where you can start to see the death rates starting to go up, which you would expect given the way the hospitalization is going up and, the, um, and of course, the caseload is going up. Uh, we got a lot of interesting things to talk about. We'll get to that. But first, let me get my guest in here is Dr. Scott Jensen. Dr. Jensen is not just a family practitioner, but he's also a state senator in the state of Minnesota. Susan, let's bring him in here. Can we do that? Mm -hmm. Here it comes. There you are, Dr. Jensen. Well, welcome to the program. 
Thank you. So tell me, for people that haven't seen your uh, video uh, that, that I caught yesterday and immediately reached out to you, to tell people what, what the content of that video was and what prompted you to do that. Well, about 10 days ago, I received a letter from the Minnesota Board of Medical Practice identifying that they were investigating me for public comments regarding COVID-19, and they listed two allegations. The first one was that I was spreading misinformation when I appeared on April 7th on a Fargo-Moorhead news program with Chris Berg. And that night, I guess it was perhaps one of the first times that anybody had talked about publicly the appropriate completion of a death certificate. And I made the comment that I felt the Department of Health in Minnesota had conveyed information that was misleading and ambiguous and really counter to what I've spent the last 35 years doing. So in the process of that discussion, uh, some pe someone evidently thought that was spreading misinformation. And the second allegation was very nebulous and it simply said that I was guilty of providing reckless advice because I compared COVID-19 to influenza outbreaks. So let's 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 dispense with that first. So I'm guessing you sort of looked at the the death rate from COVID-19 in Minnesota, or did you talk about the national death rate? Well, overall, I think the case fatality rate for many of the epidemics we've suffered, they have some level of comparability. Clearly in 1918, we don't know as much about that one because we don't have as good a data as we'd like and we didn't have any antibiotics. But certainly there's significant data out there that says 500 million people got the disease, 25 to 50 million died. You could put the uh, CFR, the fatality rate, somewhere between 5%, 2%. 10%, somewhere in there. Somewhere but there. I think in 2018, we had in this country, we had 80,000 deaths. And that was a pretty strong year. And uh, typically, we see fatality rates around 0.1 in flu. And I think most recent data I saw from CDC regarding COVID-19, what is it was going to maybe end up being somewhere around 0.3. And then you look at MERS and SARS, and you're looking at, you know, I think, 10% for SARS and 30% for MERS. So I think to provide context so people can understand what we're looking at, I think we have to compare it to something. And it doesn't make any sense to compare COVID-19 to something like leprosy or tuberculosis or Ebola or gonorrhea because it has no similarities. But right. it does have a lot of similarities to influenza. And so, and it so gives me great pleasure to introduce the audience to uh, Dr. Scott Jensen. So, Dr. Jensen, thank you for joining us, uh, and uh, I'm sure that the audience uh, just finished watching a little bit of a pre-roll about uh, your journey through this coronavirus pandemic, and uh, in the eyes of the audience, in my eyes, you're a hero. So I tip my hat to you and say thank you for everything that you've done and the personal sacrifices that you've been making, and I'm sure that your family's been making through this, so... Uh, on all of our behalf, we say thank you. Thank you, John. So it's a real honor to have you here. And uh, I wanted to share with you uh, some of the observations that the audience and I have been making through the course of this pandemic. We've been watching uh, your work as you've been, you know, uh, calling attention to certain aspects of the story. And as you've been doing that, my background, 30-something years ago, I was at Oracle working for Larry Ellison. And I built the mapping system that Johns Hopkins is using to track the virus. And when I saw how the system was being used, I, uh, I got really upset. And I'm going to show you <clears throat> what we've learned since the beginning of the pandemic, and I want to share it with you uh, to see what your take is on this. But allow me to introduce you. Uh, you know a little bit about my background with the maps and the technology. The audience started this journey in March. Highly intellectual, a lot of public health professionals in the audience, very much a global audience. There's people watching this from all over the world. They tend to believe in first principles. Uh, these are the types of people that um, they see the evidence, and if the evidence is not consistent with the narrative, 
uh, they sort of wonder well, why would that be? And they're very familiar with you and your work. There aren't 10 people dead in either Beijing or Shanghai, according to the WHO and according to Johns Hopkins. Now, a lot of people have said, well, maybe China's lying. And so I go to Japan, where we find that there aren't a thousand people dead in Tokyo. Now, I know you've had a rough time with some of the uh, authorities in your state. The medical board has given you a rough time. Minnesota today has 6,000 people that have died. And if I'm you, I feel very comfortable because the cavalry is here, doctor. The question to the folks that are poking you is how is it that Japan has fewer people dead than Minnesota? Yeah. John? Cavalry's here, you? doctor. The cavalry is here. You? Nigeria has 200 million people. <clears throat> and your state has four times the deaths? It doesn't hold up, doctor. It doesn't hold up. Ethiopia has a third of the deaths. Vietnam has 100 million people. There's 35 dead. And your state has 6,000? And they're asking you questions? It's time to turn the tables, doctor. There's fewer people dead in all of Japan with 120 million people than in the state of Minnesota. And Myanmar is not known for their world-class health care. And with 54 million people, you've got twice as many dead. I think your health director has some questions that need answers. And I'd like to ask those questions or provide them to you. Everything I'm citing here is coming directly from the CDC. Directly from their websites. CDC.gov. I'll send you the links in email. Or I go to the Johns Hopkins map, or I use World of Meter. And what I'm doing is looking at the data in a different way. Right? This is my background. This is what I'm used to doing. And I've been looking at demographics, and I've been looking at chromosomes. children 5 to 14 years old back in October 28th there were 39 dead in the country and that's when Laura Ingram started to tweet my work it was when I was calling attention to the fact that if the children aren't dying why are we closing the schools right if the kids aren't the ones who are actually dying are we following the science? And so I keep hearing Fauci and Burke say science, 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 but that doesn't really mean science. So Laura starts tweeting my charts, <clears throat> but Fox won't let her put the stuff on the air. The column on the left is birth to 44 years old in the United States. The latest update from the CDC. Less than 10,000 dead. The next column, 45 to 64. 57,000. The next column, 65 and older. But AOC got her vaccination. That was important. This is the science. This is the math. 
And then what we do is we start to look at the population size versus the deaths. And this is where we start getting a little bit more sophisticated. So when we look at the younger people from birth to 44, the size of the population is represented in green. The number of people who've died is in blue. When we get to people who are 45 to 64, the population is dramatically smaller, but the number of people who've died is greater. And then when we get to 65 and over, the population is dramatically smaller, but the number of deaths is dramatically higher. No one's doing this analysis, doctor. We don't see this anywhere. From 35 to 74 years old, almost twice as many men are dying as women in the United States. And from 35 to 54, it is twice. Now, if that were women, if women were dying twice as twice the rate as men, would we do something differently? Hypothetically. Rhetorically. 55 to 74, men in blue, women in green. Infants under one year old, comparing COVID deaths with deaths from all causes. 39 infants as of January 21st, under one year old. Over 18,000 deaths from all causes. Children one to four, deaths with COVID, 21. Children five to 14, 58 dead with COVID, 5,400 from all causes. And then we go to young, young adults, 15 to 24. There's about 500 that are dead out of 35,000 from all causes. I'm trying to bring a different perspective to put it in perspective. And then we start to look at the comorbidities. So the question is, what is the number one comorbidity? And looking at the table that the CDC provides, the number on the left is all deaths involving COVID. But then they give us in the middle of the table, deaths involving COVID-19 and pneumonia, excluding influenza. So as soon as they give me excluding influenza, I can make a pie chart. It's just math. I don't have a theory. A plus B equals C. If I told you that more than half of the people dying with coronavirus also had tuberculosis, but that nobody was testing them when they came in because they weren't coughing up blood. And so it didn't present differently. How, how would that look, right? Would it look different? What, what, would, what would people say if there was another affliction that people were dying from or dying with in addition to COVID? Well, because they give us the data of excluding influenza, and I can do this and just say, okay, well, you gave me the big number and you told me how many don't have it. So if I know how many don't have it, I'm pretty good at basic arithmetic. Well, look at what happens. Most of the kids that are dying with COVID also have influenza. Most of them. Under one year, one to four, five to 14, the blue is the excluding influenza that they give us. The green must be including. It's the only other choice. It's kind of a binary scenario. Turns out in every age group, influenza is a problem, big problem. 
So why are we talking about the flu and not SARS? Well, in Taiwan, where there's 24 and a half million people living on an island, there's seven dead. And they hate China. They don't go along with China. They hate you. They're almost going to war. They're flying planes over each other right now. Back in October, you started hearing reports about how the flu has disappeared. Miraculously, has COVID killed off the flu? How did that happen? Has COVID killed off the flu? Influenza cases nosedive by 98% across the globe. Where did that story come from? came from here. I published a paper a week earlier that jumped on a CDC paper that had just come out. The CDC paper said there's no influenza in Australia, Chile, South Africa, and the USA. And this is an official CDC paper. And I said, and the audience and I had been researching this for some time. And I'm looking at this and saying, Australia, Chile, South Africa, and the USA. And then what? You guys had a meeting to get to? And you stopped the research? And what I did was I took their paper and I built on it. Okay. And, and what I showed people is that influenza, this is now the WHO. We're now looking at the WHO's application called Flu Mart. And this is where they track influenza at the WHO. It stopped in week 11 to 14 based on the country and disappeared last year, April, January, February, March, and then first week in April, second week in April, gone. Globally, there is no influenza. So I published a paper and I said, although I'm not a doctor, I do believe I deserve the Nobel Prize in medicine for documenting the fact that there is no influenza anywhere on earth. Boom, 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 boom. There's no influenza, doctor. Yet, when I go and look at the coroner's data from the United States, it seems that the coroners and the doctors don't spend a lot of time together. There's this thing called influenza burden. And influenza burden is a calculation that comes from the CDC, right? And according to Dr. Fauci, in 2017, 2018, we had a really bad flu season. 80,000 people died. And returning it. It went way, 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 way up. Days like that are what keep Dr. Anthony Fauci up at night. In 2017, 18, we had the worst seasonal flu that we've had in memory, about 80,000 deaths and almost a million hospitalizations. You do that every year for 20, 30, 40 years. That's a huge toll. At the toll. end of that time, that's a huge toll. about 80,000 deaths. So I go to the system called FluView, and FluView is where we track PNI deaths, okay, pneumonia and influenza deaths. So although the burden that's reported was 22,000, the mortality system shows 273,000. 
it seems that the coroners and the doctors don't spend a lot of time together. There's this thing called influenza burden. And influenza burden is a calculation that comes from the CDC, right? And according to Dr. Fauci, in 2017, 2018, we had a really bad flu season. 80,000 people died. So I go to the system called FluView. And FluView is where we track PNI deaths. Okay, pneumonia and influenza deaths. So although the burden that's reported was 22,000, the mortality system shows 273,000. With over 4,000 people dying a week from PNI in the United States every single week in 2020, including before coronavirus. So before coronavirus was even a thing, before there were 200 people dead, there were 4,000 a week dying from PNI. But the burden number that was reported was 22,000. I'm like, well, you guys missing a digit? There's the data straight from their table. This is from their page. This season that started October 1st, there's not a single week with less than 4,000 dead from PNI. This has nothing to do with coronavirus. You know what with the death codes, the U codes, U09 for uh, the wonder system. That's this. That's what I'm looking at. This has nothing to do with COVID. This is pure PNI. There's over 100,000 dead this season from PNI in the CDC system. We started looking at the Spanish flu and how was it different from seasonal H1N1. And the defining characteristic seems to be the cytokine storm and the mush that it left the lung tissue in, the condition. So when you look at these charts and you compare PNI deaths to the COVID deaths excluding influenza, what we see is that they're not double counting. They're not. PNI deaths are greater than the COVID deaths minus the influenza. Right, so when we take the big COVID number, the 400,000 number, and we subtract the people that have influenza, we don't want to double count them, right? They're already in the other system. So we take those away, and what we see is that PNI deaths are actually higher than COVID deaths. And then when we go to the mortality homepage, if Dr. Fauci told us that this red peak in the middle of this graph, the middle peak was 2017-18, Night. In 2017-18, we had the worst seasonal flu that we've had in memory, about 80,000 deaths. He said that was 80,000 dead. If that's 80,000 dead, how is this double peak on the right that we just experienced? How's that 22? The one in the middle he told us was 80. He said 80,000 people died in the 2017 season from PNI, and we're looking at the PNI mortality system. So if that was 80, how's this one on the right, 22? Somebody made a mistake. There's a document from the CDC that defines what is influenza burden, and it's not how many people died. How many people died is at the top of the pyramid. It's one of the factors in the equation. It's not the end result of the equation. This is from the CDC. This is their definition document. Influenza burden is not how many people died. They're factoring in hospitalizations, symptomatic this, ILI, net that. It's complicated, and they got a whole bunch of authors on this. I'm not interested in influenza burden. I want to know how many people died from PNI. That's all I care about. I don't care about hospitalizations. I don't care about hospital beds. 
I don't care about bedpans. I want to know how many people died. Okay. And what I'm telling you is the numbers are ridiculous state by state by state. And I'm using their software, doctor. I'm in their system and I'm not hacking in. This is public. You can go on this right now. I think what we're seeing is, and it started early on, for some confounding reason, there was a willingness to distort the data or at least massage it. And I think that's what I called out in early April when I was being advised by the Minnesota Department of Health and the CDC that if I was completing a death certificate that involved possibly a COVID death or probably a COVID death, then I should go ahead and put that in part one of the death certificate as the cause of death. What was even more alarming was that they called out in that document that if COVID-19 was felt to be a contributing condition, don't put it where we put contributing conditions, which was part two, put it in part one as a cause of death. That was right off the right off the bat, the astonishing dictate, if you will. Mm-hmm. It also went on to say that in conditions put that in part two, relegate that to part two as a contributing condition. So right at the very beginning, we saw that there was some energy being given to expand COVID-19 death certificates to be maximized. Uh And along the way, you're absolutely right, John, influenza fell off the radar screen. There were some hints in this fall that because the Southern hemispheres had experienced a very mild flu season, that we might also have a very mild flu season. But if you look at the numbers that we have right now, January 25th, I've never seen a year so devoid of influenza. I'm looking at the fact that when my patients go to the emergency room, Mm -hmm. they're not even being tested for influenza. Right, right. They're being tested with a PCR test that we know is fraught with large numbers, large percentages of false positives. And that that is spilling over to the entire practice of medicine in the United States. We are not looking or considering influenza at the normal level that we nor- that we would. Normally, the amount of cognitive energy that we would give for influenza would be substantial on mm-hmm. January 25th. In today's morning rounds, this flu season is on track to be one of the worst in recent history. In terms of the number of people infected, flu is now widespread in almost every single state, and nearly 10 million people have become ill so far. 4,800 of those people have died. Take a look. You see all that red? I mean, how could you not? That should be a red flag about just how bad this year's flu season has gotten. The CDC says influenza is widespread in all but two states and Washington, D.C. It's that map, that rampant spreading virus we should be worried about. But in the last week, most of what we hear about when it comes to health news is the coronavirus.
no testing for it. Everything's being lumped in, as you said, it's being lumped into a different bucket. And that bucket is COVID. And if it's a comorbidity, if it turns out that people have both. So for example, we know that most people that die from influenza are actually dying from pneumonia. We know that, the audience knows that, right? But I think, yes. I think it's very similar with coronavirus. I believe that many of the people who are dying with coronavirus also have acute respiratory distress s- syndrome, also have pneumonia that's a disaster. What we keep hearing is that the lung tissue is just like jelly. It's just destroyed. We keep hearing this again and again post-mortem. And so what you're saying is that the frontline doctors have been so myopically hypnotized, and I'm, you know, I'm kind of putting words in your mouth, but this notion of everybody being so focused on coronavirus, 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 almost like hypnosis, that we forgot all about influenza. Now, if it turns out that it's a particularly dangerous strain of H1N1 that's remarkably similar to the strain from the Spanish flu. There is a story about it, Walter Reed. I'm not sure if you know Jeffrey Taubenberger and Ann Reed and the story of this. Did you hear about this in the past? Is this something you're familiar with or no? No, I'm not. All right, so uh, it turns out that the NIH and Dr. Fauci funded a project in 2005 at Walter Reed to resurrect or recreate the Spanish flu. Uh, And you can think of flu in 1918 and otherwise like that garbage can or like a shot to the ribs. Uh, It it, it lands you on your back for a few weeks. It creates inflammation, fluid buildup in in your lungs where where you need them clear for oxygen, uh, for gas exchange. Uh, And pneumonia is really, really deadly. It always has been and it still is. and that's what killed people in 1918. The other clue is that it was an H1N1 virus. And so how do we know that? We know that because people like Jeff Taubenberger uh, and his team have actually gone back to tissue samples from 1918. So here we have wax embedded um, autopsy tissue samples taken from a, vic- a victim of the Spanish flu. Uh, and Jeff Taubenberger and his team uh, take slices of that material uh, and they amplify up that genome uh, that, uh, that we saw before. So we know exactly, genetically, what this thing uh, looked like. In fact, the, the one complete genome that we have from 1918 uh, comes from here. So this is a place called Brevik Mission, which was, is a little village in Alaska. Uh, and in 1918, the Spanish flu pretty much wiped out the whole village. And a lot of people ended up uh, in mass graves. And this guy here, um, Johan Holten, he's a virologist who for years uh, had been saying, you know, we might be able to get virus uh, out, of, uh, out of those graves. If they were buried in permafrost, you might have good preservation of material. Uh, he tried in the 50s. Uh, at a time before genomics and amplifying gene sequences. What he needed to do then was actually get a live virus. Couldn't do it. Not possible. Everything's kind of dead and fragmented. So we went back uh, in the 90s on a solitary trip. Here's, I thought this was funny. um, So he carried just one tool, a pair of garden clippers borrowed from his wife without permission. And uh, let me just go back. There they are. Okay, so from this mass grave, via Mrs. Holton's garden clippers, to the big screen. That, that's not just a flu genome, that is the 
Spanish flu genome from that victim, from that mass grave in Alaska. Those A's, C's, G's, and T's are the virus that killed that person and so many others in 1918. Michael. Yeah, Rich. So, um, on that one slide showing the strains circulating through humans through time, you, uh, at the end you had the H3N2 and you had the H1N1 and it said H1N1 lab escape. H1N1 and it said H1N1 lab escape. Yeah, so I thought someone might ask about that. So uh, in 1957, H, the, the Spanish flu-like H1N1 went extinct when H2N2 emerged. In 1968, H3N2 kicked out H2N2, but in 1977, there was a kind of mini pandemic, and H1N1 reemerged. Uh, and bottom line is, if you look at the uh, molecular clocks, it was frozen in time, not even since 1957, but it was a 1950 H1N1 strain. Uh, and it's virtually certain that it was an accidental escape, probably from an experimental uh, strain uh, from China or, or, or Russia. And, and so, yes, the worst pathogen in human history was accidentally re-released, uh, and not too many people know about it until you guys. <laughs> So this was funded by the government in 2005. 2009, we had the swine flu outbreak, which was an H1N1 variant. And the chart that I just showed you a minute or two ago, the 80,000 in the middle is nothing compared to that, that huge hump that we had off to the right, right? So w w the audience and I are baffled. This is the reconstruction of the 1918 pandemic virus by uh, Dr. Jeffrey Talberberg. So the CDC brags about it. They're telling you, yeah, 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 this was a great project. It was exciting. We went to Alaska. It was actually, the story was on the cover of Sports Illustrated and how they went to Alaska to get the Spanish flu genome. And then they sequenced it. Last year, more people died of influenza than died from coronavirus in the United States. According to the CDC, according to their data. And nobody's looking. And you see how the green doesn't even show up until week 12? All the blue before that is influenza deaths. And we were in a bad season in January, February 2020. It was bad. Then coronavirus shows up. States may be reaching a peak, and so far it looks like a more severe season than others in recent memory. John Yang gets an update on why and what you need to know. This flu season started earlier than in the past, and the Centers for Disease Control says it's the most widespread outbreak it has ever seen. Numbers may surprise you. From October 1st, 2019 through January 25th, 2020, the Centers for Disease Control estimates nationwide 19 million to 26 million people had flu illnesses and 10,000 to 25,000 died from the flu. Everybody stops testing for influenza except the coroners post-mortem. And that's where I'm getting my data. I'm getting the mortality data. I'm going to the, the, the death certificate database. And that's where your journey started. You started by complaining, why are you asking me to screw with death certificates? I've been doing it this way my entire career. And that's where you started. 
My next guest is a doctor and state senator in Minnesota who is deeply troubled by the CDC's latest guidance for counting COVID deaths. Dr. Scott Jensen joins me now. Uh, doctor, I want to read for our viewers what the CDC says in part about how to count COVID deaths r relating to that last issue we just raised. In cases where a definite diagnosis of COVID cannot be made, but is suspected or likely, like the circumstances are compelling with a reasonable degree of certainty, it is acceptable to report COVID-19 on a death certificate as probable or presumed. So, doctor, what's the problem with that? Well, in short, it's ridiculous. I spent some time earlier today just going through the CDC's manual on how to complete death certificates and part, the parts that were specifically written for physicians. And in that manual, it talks of precision and specificity, and that's what we were trained with. The determination of the cause of death is a big deal. It has impact on estate planning. It has impact on future generations. And the idea that we're going to allow people to massage and sort of game the numbers is a real issue because we're going to undermine the trust. And right now, as we see politicians doing things that aren't necessarily motivated on fact and science, the public's going to, their trust in politicians is already wearing thin. And I go looking at the death certificate data and I said, wait a second, you have 4,000 people a week dying of P&I? That's unprecedented. That's never happened before. You've never had 4,000 people a week dying from P&I. All, this is all CDC stuff. This is coming. And then I go to the WHO, and I'm like, wh why is there no influenza anywhere on Earth? Anywhere. Except for Cambodia. I found some in Cambodia. Switzerland, it's gone. United States, it's gone. No, but it's not gone. According to the coroners, plenty of people are dying. Just nobody's testing. This is every country. I think that's absolutely right, John. I think that the testing has for influenza just literally dropped off dramatically as if the spigot was turned off. And that, that isn't problematic enough. We've replaced that with PCR testing, which we know, as and you know, that the false positive rate with PCR testing can be dramatically inflated to the point where some New England studies had demonstrated that possibly even up to 80, 85 percent of people who had been identified as positive COVID cases were indeed not. So I think you make a very good point. We saw this encroachment on intellectual honesty uh -huh. start. You're pointing out that instead of just focusing on the mechanism of completing a death certificate, let's look at what historically drives our seasonal respiratory illnesses, which is influenza and influenza pneumonia. And then we can say, yes, COVID-19 is here. But I think this is why the death certificate thing is probably the easiest one to audit and to try to bring some clarity to the situation. But clearly, it won't it won't give us the kind of clarity that we should have had because we have allowed, I should say, the CDC, the World Health Organization, multiple agencies have allowed the normal data stream and the normal data analysis to be corrupted in such a way that we will not be able to recover that data because, frankly, the bodies are buried. But we can still go back and say how many of the death certificates by their own accord reveal that COVID was not the underlying cause of death. Because we can at least say then, we may have 20, 30%. Mm -hmm. And then if we look at another large chunk mm -hmm. of deaths and say, these are long-term care facilities. And then we look at your graph you have here, and we say, don't we have a profound intellectual curiosity as to why Vietnam has recorded 35 deaths in Nigeria, 1,500, and Japan, 5,000? Uh, all I've been saying, doctor, the, the whole time, all I keep saying is, isn't this worth further investigation? If you were the, the, uh, in charge of the Department of Health for any state, you know, start with New York, because New York is just an absolute disaster. Why would you not pick up the phone and call Japan? 
aren't they our friends? They're our friends, right? We're friends with Korea. We're friends with, with Vietnam. Why would we not call their health minister and say, what the heck are you guys doing? How did you pull this off? Nigeria is laughing at Rhode Island. Nigeria has 200 million people. Korea. What is your hypothesis in terms of what's happened here? What do you, what do you see as the underlying? You have different rubrics being used in different countries. So Vietnam is not running their PCR tests through the recombinator 45 times. And if somebody dies on a motorcycle with COVID, it's not counted. The, the first column in, in our, and Dr. Burks told us this, right? So Dr. Burks said, uh, you know, we count things differently, right? So I think in this country, we've taken a very liberal approach to mortality. There are other countries that if you had a pre-existing condition, and let's say the virus called you to go to the ICU and then have a heart or kidney problem, some countries are recording that as a heart issue or a kidney issue and not a COVID-19 death. Um, right now, we're still recording it. And we'll, I mean, the great thing about having forms that come in and a form that has the ability to mark it as COVID-19 infection, the intent is right now that those, if someone dies with COVID-19, we are counting that as a COVID-19 death. Are you, can you be sure? I mean, you hear from coroners that that's not necessarily the case. Or are you sure? How can you be confident about that? And is there any concern that it skews? Told us that. And uh, let me see. The way we count deaths on the table, the first column is all deaths involving COVID. And that's what Dr. Burke said. So all deaths involving mm -hmm. COVID is, you know, uh, Alzheimer's, cancer, right? Uh, kidney disease and COVID. But if these people are 85 years old with kidney disease or 85 years old with Alzheimer's, did COVID, was it the straw that broke their back? Yes. Were they likely to die if they had influenza as well? How many of these people also have influenza is real easy. We go to that middle column that says, well, how many don't have influenza? And I just get the other, the other side of the pie on the pie chart. More than half of the people have influenza, but we're not finding out until they're dead. And this is why I said, what if it was tuberculosis? Everybody would be freaking out. Everybody, well, what do you mean everybody's got coronavirus and tuberculosis? That's impossible. No, it's not. It's been disguised. You've got two infections at the same time. You're testing for one, but that second one is going to kill you. For sure. And more than 50% have it. To give you an example, John, two years ago, if I'm making rounds in the nursing home, and my patient is profoundly demented, mm -hmm. losing weight, family knows it. I'll share with them, it's just a matter of time. Mm -hmm. We don't know when. Right. And if that patient, over a 72-hour period, appetite just virtually stopped, and maybe in the last 12 hours had a cough, and there was influenza going around the nursing home, and the patient succumbs, I would never put down the cause of death was influenza. Right. The underlying cause of death would be dementia. Mm -hmm. This is where we've gone wrong this year, is we have been encouraged that in that situation, regardless of influenza going around the nursing home, the CDC has basically said, if it's probable of COVID, call it COVID. If you don't do a test, that's okay. Is it, is if you do do a test. Well, it's negative. Still call it COVID. And then they had the nerve to tell us, and oh, by the way, we're not going to be auditing the cause of death in this. So they're basically saying, don't worry about it. Don't worry about a lack of precision or a lack of accuracy. And then 
what I've been saying, John, is if you follow the money, mm -hmm. you'll see that if you hit a certain frequency or excuse me, if you hit a certain number, a certain threshold of COVID-19 admissions to the hospital between January 1st and June 10th, then you get a, a spiff of $77,000 per COVID-19 admission. Yeah. Yeah, and CDC Director Redfield acknowledged, uh, Phil, that hospitals do have this financial incentive to maybe play with the numbers. We've seen this in other disease processes too, early in the HIV epidemic. Somebody may have a heart attack, but also have HIV. The hospital would prefer the DRG for HIV because there's greater reimbursement. When it comes to death reporting though, I mean, ultimately it's how the physician defines it in the death certificate. And when it comes to hospital reimbursements, there could be some play in that for sure. And Phil Kirpin, president of the Committee to Unleash Prosperity. Phil, how widespread is this, do you think? Well, I think it's pretty widespread. Uh, and we definitely saw it when, when the high impact funding was uh, coming up and we had those deadlines and hospitals had to get their 100 coronavirus patients to get the $75,000 each. And hospitals had to get their 100 coronavirus patients to get the $75,000 each. And hospitals had to get their 100 coronavirus patients to get the $75,000 each. Get the $75,000 each. Get the $75,000 each. Prior to September 1st, they didn't even need a test. They could just say, we think this person has coronavirus, reimburse us 20% more and add that to the patient. Now the federal government is requiring that they do a test. Mm -hmm. but we know so you can imagine the, f the frenetic activity to, by, for heaven's sakes, test everybody. And so we're testing everybody and we're doing it with a test that's cycling 44 times. It's absolutely what? thrown out the window. And then, the, and then we have the bureaucrats telling us that because we're thinking about this, we're conspiracy theorists. Right, right. Well, and, that, and that's what I mean. You've suffered personally. You've suffered the ad hominem attacks. They came after you. They came after you and your license and your, your reputation. And that's why it's important that the audience uh, understands what you've been through and these tribulations. And they say you speak facts to power. I'm using the CDC's data. I'm using the WHO's data. I'm using the map from Johns Hopkins that I built. You're going to tell me I'm not qualified? Are you going to tell me that, I, that I'm not seeing that there's less than 10 people dead in Beijing? There's no one dead in Laos. There's no one dead in Cambodia. And Thailand has a thousand times fewer dead than France? It has to be the rubric. We're not using the same set of test criteria. And if there was an H1N1 pandemic, that, you know, again, when we, when we look at the, um, if, if I look at the, uh, the WHO's reporting, and we see that, you know, somehow mysteriously, it just disappeared. Well, how did that happen? Just all across the globe, it disappeared. That seems a little bizarre. And so when you start being called a conspiracy theorist, who, who did they all just stop testing? Every country on earth stopped testing for influenza simultaneously? Or the who stopped picking up the phone? Or is it simply the fax machine at the who is broken? Is that what it is? Why? Why is this? John, I think a point that I want to emphasize that you made a few moments ago is if you're in charge of a state's Department of Health, take New York State, and you see some of the data you're showing here, and you see that the number of deaths in countries that have a substantially larger population than you do is dramatically different. And you, would you not say, I have got to figure this out? Is it the rubrics? What are we doing? Are we doing something wrong? Are we not comparing apples to apples and oranges to oranges? This is what astonishes me too. It seems like the, 
the appetite for intellectual curiosity is is just dried up. And we have this group think whereby you've got all the sort of, the, if you will, the agency people, the bureaucrats, the, the, the ivory tower folks. And they're sitting over here and saying, everything's right. Mm-hmm. No problems. Mm-hmm. Regardless of the fact we've seen the CDC stumble and bumble and hiccup many times. I'm not asking anybody to say that I'm categorically correct or that people are trying to lie, cheat, or steal. I'm just saying, shouldn't we have more commitment to a true scientific effort and real data and quit with the mantra, follow the science, which has become nothing more than a three word political slogan that has no bearing anymore because things have been so corrupted. This is what confuses me is why wouldn't you say less? Let's audit it. Let's figure this out. Let's all do it across the nation. Because mm-hmm. exactly. Deserve to, because what's going to happen is we're going to see the federal registrar and we're going to see the number of cardiovascular deaths mm-hmm. drop mm-hmm. because everything's being covered. We're going to see the cancer deaths drop. And then we're going to ask, gee, did the cancer deaths drop because of the recent chemotherapy agents that have been introduced to the market, which very likely would have nothing to do with it. But we're going to ask those questions because our data is so corrupted. We have to. And what what I'm trying to do is provide sort of a little bit of a guide as to where to look. Right. So, for example, when we were looking at chromosomes, whether you're XX or XY, it makes a difference. And in fact, in infants, one and younger, it really makes a difference. Little baby boys are dying more than little baby girls. And I don't know that anybody knows that. And I'm just trying to save lives. And I believe that if more people understood that we've got a problem that is a co-infection, and that if we were to rediscuss and reintroduce Tamiflu, Oseltamivir, and the new antiviral, Zofluza, Aloxamivir, just was approved a year ago. There are antivirals that treat H1N1. Nobody's talking about them. Why is that? If every, if if more than half of these people are dying with influenza, why would we not want to also treat the influenza? especially if it's H1N1 and it's this particularly wicked one that causes cytokine storms. Welcome to Life in Biology. I'm Dr. Joel Graf and this is episode number nine. Uh, Today we're going to be talking about the Spanish flu and uh, what I consider to be a famous experiment where they resurrected the Spanish flu uh, the 1918 flu in 2005 after all the virus had been extinct from the world. So, severe damage. And the severe damage was due to something called cytokine storms. Um, the first time I ever heard the term cytokine storms was in, in regard to the 1918 flu virus. Basically, cytokines are proteins that cells use to communicate with each other. Cytokines often tell you if there's danger, and so cells start making these danger signals and it brings in uh, more immune cells, and the immune cells uh, are, are all acting up and they can cause damage to your tissue. And that causes this severe pathology from the virus, and then we talked about secondary bacterial infections earlier. Those secondary bacterial infections can then um, take advantage of a damaged lung or airway and get get hold and, and, and cause really severe pneumonia that could be lethal. I'm, I'm less worried about hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin I'm more concerned that if more than half the people have got H1N1, I want to get Oseltamivir into them. I want to get Baloxmavir into them, and I'm not a doctor. But I know that those are antivirals for H1N1. So if more than half of the people have H1N1 that are dying, these are the dead. That's all I'm looking at are dead folks. They weren't tested when they came in for it, but the coroner tests them. 
And that's where I'm getting my data. And this changes everything. Look at under one year. Look at that. Under one year, only six kids don't have influenza with COVID. 33 of them had COVID and influenza. One to four is a much bigger population of kids, but fewer died. So infants one and younger are more susceptible than toddlers one to four. Toddlers one to four, we've got fewer dead and it's a much larger population of kids. And then when we get to five to 14, only 11 of those kids had COVID and not influenza, excluding influenza. 47 of them had influenza. We've got to tell the world we've got a double pandemic and we've got to get Tamiflu, Oseltamivir, or Baloxamivir, or in Japan, they have something called Avigan that's not approved here. But you can find out what are the approved uh, H1N1 antivirals. And why are we not giving that to these people if, in fact, we're finding out post-mortem that's what they died with? Right? Under one year, one to four and five to 14. Green is with influenza, blue, just COVID without influenza. Maybe COVID with, uh, could be like COVID and cystic fibrosis or something like that. But with John, I would want to make the comment that I don't have a great deal of faith in oseltamivir either, because if you actually look at it in terms of treating influenza viruses, typically it doesn't stop the disease in its tracks. It, it probably shortens symptoms uh, by and two that's or three fine. days. We're in your it world then. It's okay. It's you've got the ball. As long as you know you've got a patient that's co-infected, you've got the ball. You do what you got to do. Now you know what's going on. I don't care if you never use oseltamivir and you're like, you know, baloxamivir is so much more sophisticated. And here's, you know, we don't know. You're the doctor. But I'm telling you, we're checking with the coroners and the coroners are telling us more than half these people had influenza. You guys, it was almost like an illusion. It's almost like group hypnosis and it went around the world. And the fact that the WHO isn't checking or they're not recording it except for Cambodia. And I think Cambodia and Vietnam are the only two countries I see any influenza in at the WHO's uh, websites. So we've looked at chromosomes. We've looked at uh, comorbidity and the number one comorbidity. We've looked around the world and we've realized that, uh, you know, there, there's not that many places around the world that have got uh, as many people dead as Minnesota. And we've been wondering whatever happened to the depletion of susceptibles, right? You know, isn't that supposed to happen at the end of, a, of an outbreak, right? Or aren't people stop dying and, you know, the, the, the number of people who are susceptible starts to go down? And that, mm -hmm. so now we're in our third peak. How many trinodal outbreaks are there or are we just in the middle of our next influenza season? Because the system says there's over 100,000 dead already this season in the USA. I've taken so much of your time. I can't thank you enough, and I don't want to make you late for your next meeting. You've got a whole bunch of people waiting for you. But I would love to have you back on the show uh, to discuss what do we do now. Because now that you know this, there's more. There's there's more. This is we're just getting you started. All right, and this is CDC and who and Johns Hopkins data. That's all this is. It strikes me, John, that we can make a significant difference if right now we said nobody gets to do a PCR test unless they do influenza A and B right alongside of it. So we would get that data. And then also say, and nobody gets to do a PCR test that cycles more than 33 times. Well, you know that the WHO just released new guidance this past week, right after the inauguration. In fact, I, okay, so the audience knows that also. I've posted that on my Patreon page, uh, that there is new guidance from the WHO and that they are toning it down a bit and they expect there to be fewer cases. 
But when we look at places like Vietnam, we look at Korea, Kenya, uh, Ethiopia, these are huge countries. The rubric can't be the same. It can't be. It can't be. And uh, the, the tragedy is there are millions of people dying with influenza. And very few people know. But now you know. And uh, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. I hope you will come back and talk with us further. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, John. Hear us. for one.